Okay, hi, I'm April Battles. My business name is Holistic Horseworks. That's my website. I, you can also find me on YouTube under Holistic Horseworks. I develop my own yoga for horses that is a osteopathic form of opening and invigorating and endorphining and just opening your whole horse's body, but it is a diagnostic tool. If your horse cannot do the yoga well, then you need to seek professional help. If you are on dial-up and you can't get it free on YouTube, I do have it on DVD. Okay, there's a Horses for Headaches and an Equine Bodywork DVD too. We can go more into that later. Basically, I started these clinics because there's too many horses going to slaughter yards, um, free horse rescue places. They're being retired at ages 12 through 20, and if they live and eat till they're 30, they should be rideable till they're 30. Okay, and that's my goal. If we can diagnose some of these issues ahead of time and prevent them, okay, your horse can keep going. The only thing that's taken our horses down is arthritic hocks and stifles. Side bone, ring bone, they're all calcifications. Anytime you have heat and loading in a body that's an overload, you are going to develop calcifications because the body sends calcium to heat to lock it down. Arthritic hocks, arthritic stifles, injecting joints. Can we prevent all this? That's what this clinic's all about. Okay, so we're going to start talking about the whole horse, how the whole horse should be able to move. For a horse to be able to move correctly under saddle and not compensate, you need to have a neck that telescopes out of the neck. Your scapula and shoulders need to come out, your withers need to lift, your ribs need to lift, and your pelvis needs to move independently. If one thing can't do its job, three to five other things are going to be compensating. So you have all your neck bones, your shoulder, your muscles. The horse has 205 bones and 700 muscles. So if one of those isn't doing its job, there's a lot that's compensating. Okay, um, everybody know about your seven neck bones? Okay, no? Yes? Okay, your atlas and your axis are the first two, and they're the ones that take the major, the major torque when a horse sits down and pulls. There's a lot of damage from one sit-down pullback that is not addressed. Some professionals will say the horse is fine. I disagree. There's a lot of damage done to a nuchal ligament attachment at the base of the skull. Your horse will never be able to flex freely at the pole and correctly to get on the bit unless you address that damage. I'd say 90% of the horses out there in training have sat down and pulled back once. Okay, if you're going to teach a horse to tie, please don't use the knotted rope halters. They do not give. They are a thinner rope and they do more damage when they sit down and pull. That's a rope for cliffs to hang by. It's a non-breaking rope. So try to have some kind of bungee stretchy thing in there and just use it as a training tool that they are designed to be. That knot that comes out on here hits a huge ganglia of nerve and that's why it's a good training tool. But don't leave them tied overnight, don't leave them tied unsupervised. Okay, you've got seven neck bones that need to move and with this one sit down pullback and these getting out of alignment and wrenching and tearing muscles up in here, losing all your flexion at the pole, if the horse is not comfortable to come onto the bit, they're gonna shirk down with their neck. Your horse is going to start to develop a short neck and they're going to start to get heavy on the floor. If it hurts here and you've got something pulling here, you're going to go down like this. A horse heavy on the floor is then sometimes put into training aids, running martingales, a different bit, bits with the shank, something to pick up the horse off a heavy front end. Okay. If this body part cannot do its job correctly and it's locking down into here, they're going to borrow all the way back from here. Okay, all of these ribs are going to get tight and all of this hind end is going to get sore. You see in the horses that are developing a u-neck? Okay, they're pulling with these muscles down to the pectoral muscles, to your abdominal obliques, all the way up here to the groin. If you see a u-neck horse, you're going to have this dip because they're not using the rhomboids and trapezius to lift the front end. They're pulling all the way through here to a groin and you're going to see them exhibit this kind of posture with my feet out in the pasture. Okay, if your horse is to have a hind end to come back to to collect and use, your hip, your hock, and your feet should all be in alignment. Your hock should be pointing backwards and your sacrum should be open to have a hind end to come back to to use. Is that making sense?
Okay, mm -hmm. so you've got your seven neck bones. These don't actually come out of alignment, but the muscles can go so tight and into spasm that they don't allow them to move. Okay, that's your heavy neck to you neck horses. All this is coming down, the bones are closer. You're developing heat and calcification, so you'll hear of some older horses with arthritis in the neck. Okay, they get stiff, they can't turn this way, you have no lateral flexion. Okay, all this is just squinched down into here. So when we evaluate horses later, we're going to talk about conformation versus posture. Conformation is what you're born with. This horse is developing posture. Okay, if you hurt, everyone knows a muscle and spasm shortens, right? Overworked in the garden, your back goes eep, and you wake up the next day and you're walking like this until you take some ibuprofen, you work it out. Okay, our horses don't always have that opportunity. They can overwork doing something for us one day because horses work from the heart. And if they're a really expensive horse and they're put in a really tall, tiny small box, then they can't move it, they can't run, they can't roll, they can't work out that knot. So then they have a tight compensation, but then they have to go to work the next day and they're going to borrow from something else. Okay, if you see these people that walk around in pain, they're like this. Okay. If you do yoga and you stretch and you're using everything, this starts to come like this and you're walking like this. So which horse do you think is going to last longer? The one that's going like this or the one that's going like this? You know, why do some horses, people are riding them until they're 28 and some are done at 12? Okay, if nothing in the front end can do its job correctly, you will be, if you're in any kind of competition, injecting hawks by the time they're 12 or 14. It needs to stop. You need to start looking into preventative. Okay, you've got your seven neck bones that need to be able to work in flex and telescope. Okay, without tight spasmy muscles. So a muscle and spasm understand that you are not getting oxygen and blood flow and nutrients. So giving them two weeks or three months off does not make it better. Okay, it's tight, it's in spasm, they can't do anything about it. You need to open it and stretch it and encourage circulation. If you don't have them worked on, it's not going to happen by themselves. Okay. If you come down into here, their shoulder, their scapula, is not attached by bone. Humans have a collarbone. Horses don't. They carry 70% of all the weight on the body on the front end, and it's only out there by muscle. So if you have a horse that's resistant to the farrier to pick up a hoof, you have a horse that's short striding, you have a horse that the rears are coming up and hitting the fronts and interfering, you have tight muscles under your scapula to your intercostals. All your horses that are heavy on the fore, you got to get that neck and you got to get this out. Then this is going to come up. Then you're going to have a lift and a light poof, poof, poof horse, okay? And this starts to lock down, you've got a thrunt, thrunt, thrunt horse. Making sense? The other thing with your dogs and your horses that you don't want to see when they're cantering and galloping, I'm trying to teach you diagnostic tools. You do not want to see the two hind legs coming together. Okay, they should be in an egg beater pattern. Your dogs and your horses. Your sacrum's locked if they're cantering or galloping together. And you'll see that a lot. If you decide to do my yoga every day, you will know when your horse is not at its peak because it is a diagnostic tool. That left leg needs to stretch over and across to that drunken horse pose as far as the right leg does. If you only get one third of that, don't ride that horse until you get that because you already have an issue. If this shoulder cannot move freely, the right shoulder is going to work twice as hard to pick it up and bring it through. Okay. So here you've got the whole front end. This one's a little stuck and not coming through. They're going to use neck muscles, which is your rhomboids and your trapezius, to bring it up and through. You're going to overload the outside of this hoof. That's going to give you low heel. This one's going to come through freely and land toe first, then heel. So there's your high lows, your medial lateral imbalance. You're also, with that extra heat and overloading, going to start to get side bone on the outside of the hoof that's working twice as hard. Okay, I'm not against Western medicine and I'm not against vets, so I want to say that right up front. Um, I don't know if all of them have the whole picture because they don't ride and train horses. You bow a tendon or a suspensory on a well-legged up horse and you're wondering why. We ride five days a week, seems fine, didn't do anything extra, and all of a sudden we have a mysterious lameness. Okay, well what you need to go back into is, okay, this leg broke down. 
but why was it working twice as hard as the other one? So you give them stall rest, you wrap them, you beat them, you get the tenon or suspensory better, you do all the hand walking, you go through the whole process and they go back to work and it happens again. You haven't addressed why the leg was overworking. Okay, we're going to go out and palpate coronet bands. You're going to start to learn when side bone is starting in your horse. That's an overloading. So if this isn't moving freely, it is not a bone or a joint enhancement. It is muscle. You can do something about muscle. Okay? If you have a tight attachment up in here and you're walking like this, okay, what are your feet going to look like? Are they going to be balanced? Are you going to wear off the outside or the inside of your shoes? Okay? So this is also about working with your farrier and your barefoot trimmers. Okay, your high-low, your medial lateral balance, you can start to work on an addressing by just even the yoga. Okay, ask your farrier questions. What are you seeing? What is my horse at? Do you see him jamming a heel? You know, become more aware. Because these are all the precursors to all the breakdowns. Okay, so here's your front end. Most people that I've been talking to recently seem to think the ribs start about here. Your ribs go all the way up to <coughs> under the point of the shoulder. C7 in your first rib is right under here. That first rib comes out pulling a shoe with the hind foot, running across the pasture and going down in a mud bog. Anytime this whole shoulder and scapula drops and the body's going forward. Okay? Uh, first rib gives me 90% of all my business. There's, I have a release for it. It starts why the scapula cannot move through freely, why the front end is overloading. And when you yank and pull this down, this muscle attachment is attached to the withers. The withers are coming with it. So when you pull that first rib, you're putting withers out. So now these are off center, this is tight, this can't move freely. Do you think you're going to have front end issues? Okay. If you're continually asking for a left or a right lead canter and the horse is uncomfortable doing so, there is a reason. They're not being lazy and they're not being stubborn. It's letting you know that the scapula cannot come through freely. If we keep asking for it, they will borrow. Here's your intercostals. They will shorten all these muscles to borrow from back here to pick it up to give it to you. When we evaluate these horses that have first rib out, you will see when you stand behind them, one side of their tummy or their ribs looks off. Then you're going to have saddle fit issues. One side of the back is tighter. Muscle and spasm shortens, okay, so the ribs are going to drop. There's no reason for a horse's top line to drop. They should stay up here. That's muscle atrophy, okay? Muscles and spasm not getting blood flow and oxygen. So we come back into here, we're sitting on the weakest part of the horse, their suspension bridge. We need to make sure everything is working comfortably and freely in here and in here to carry us well. Okay, we need them to round up and collect. They need to open these ribs and be able to expand. Okay, your 18th and 17th rib need to be able to lift for the hind end to come over, to come under to canter on that lead correctly. If you can't do those butt tucks and the belly lifts on my yoga and these ribs are locked down because this is in spasm, your horse is cantering with his underbelly, he's going to become girthy, and he's going to become really tight to the groin. Okay, so he's borrowing from all of this because this can't do its job. Okay, we're going to go into, you've got 18 ribs, 6 lower lumbar unless you have an Arabian and then it's 5. This area, the um, psoas muscles that are on each side of your lower lumbar, go into spasm, shortening to lift up the heavy front end. Okay. The longer it's in spasm over the years, you will start to see your roach back. These muscles have brought these bones so close, bone on bone, heat, calcification, arthritis. Okay. You have nothing going back to the hind end through your spinal column for energy. It's never going to get better by itself. Okay. When this tightens down, this is also your muscle that lifts your stifle. This is your psoas muscle. So if this is tight and locked, how can your horse pick up correctly? How can he jump? How can he go around a barrel fast? How can he bring up under himself to propel? 
So if this is locked down, he's going like this and he's using more hock. You can't use your first joint, you're overusing your second joint. So your hocks are going to start to get really tired and sore. They're overworking. When we evaluate horses, we're going to evaluate they shouldn't have big muscling up here, a total flat dropped off area here, and a big muscle on each side of the tail. That's letting you know that horse is so locked down, he's throwing so far back to the hocks to pick himself up with the rider, okay, that the whole inside of your hocks are strained. We'll be showing you that on the evaluation. Your horse should have a nice, well-rounded butt using all of your butt muscles, not just some of them. Okay, so this means stifles isn't working. This up here means hocks are overworking. You've got tight tummy muscles, and they still can go down and top 10 an endurance ride. They can still go win a race on a track. They're just not going to do it for very long. Okay. Up in here, when your pelvis goes out, okay, unless the horse rolls and hooks a leg in a fence, the only way their hips go out is by a muscle shortening and in spasm. So if you have a body worker coming back and the withers and the pelvis are always out every time he comes, you need to look into doing your own homework and doing your yoga. Because you have a muscle tightening pulling the hip forward. Unless they slipped and tweaked and fell on the bank on a mud or something. You have something in here not moving correctly. Every muscle is attached to a bone, tendon, or ligament. If it's short and tight, there's something that isn't moving correctly. Okay? When we palpate muscles today, every muscle on the horse's body, I don't care if they're a steeplechaser, barrel racer, cutting horse, should be as soft as your thigh muscle. A healthy muscle gets oxygen, blood flow, nutrients, and has elasticity. Okay? So we're going to be palpating muscles all over the body to see what's moving and working correctly and what isn't, what's getting oxygen and blood flow. You have a tight groin or deltoid muscle and it is pulling something in the, talk, in the hock, the um, suspensory, somewhere down the leg. Something's going to go. Okay. If your hip is out here, your hock and your hoof should be out here and there should be a gap. If you look where the hip bone to the leg bone to the hock is, they should all be in a line. They shouldn't come in. Once your hock starts turning in, okay, then you think it's conformation, it's actually posture. You have a tight groin. If you have a tight groin, you are not using your groin correctly. He can't. You're going to blow your hocks. Okay. And using this horse here, his muscling, he already has a little bit of a dip in here. Your nuchal ligament comes down into here and ties into your longissimus muscle. This is what lifts and moves the head. Okay? If they have one sit-down pullback damage, it's like a telephone cord, the old kind that you had to undo. And it had to tsh, okay? If you have knots and ravels up in here, you're going to have the same twist at the other end in the withers. The whole thing has to be smooth and working in its sheath. Okay, your rhomboids near trapezius are to lift, but they should be developed and they should be straight through here. That is your lift. Okay, that isn't, let's get it in a bit and frame and get it like this. That's this kind of lift. They need to actually come up and lift here, honestly. Okay, you shouldn't have heavy muscling in here. You don't need to have a dip in your horse's back. He can be 25 years old and you can keep that back up to be a bareback back. These ribs and longissimus muscle need to be comfortable and open to come up and be able to support you. They need to be able to do the belly lifts easily. Okay? When you do the butt tucks on my yoga, the whole horse should roll up with the spine like that and all the ribs should spring like a pumpkin in 30 seconds. It's okay, that horse is ready to go. He's ready to round up, he's ready to collect, he's ready to open the diaphragm and breathe, and he's ready to engage his hind end. You do it one day, he goes, oh man, he's not doing them good today. You need to go back a step and stretch. Okay, so we talked about all of this. This, is, this horse is showing what I would say, I wouldn't buy him because he looks so straight in here. Like if he wanted a hunter jumper, even though he looks like the breed. This is so tight and it pulls this this way that this is going to lock in. You're going to have a straight stifle. You see that straightness? And he's actually out kind of behind him. This should be bent and this hoof should be more up in here. Okay. I can tell his lower back's in spasm. When you put a string from the horse's shoulder down to his front leg, his hoof should be here if they're standing comfortable. When your horse is comfortable, they should be standing right under their shoulder. If we go and we look at them and they're standing a little bit over, they're trying to get spasms out of their lower back. 
you're also going to find them kind of standing under. So if they're standing over on the front end, God's gift is to give them longer toes so they don't fall off, fall over. What do we do? File the toes back. Okay, so that puts a really big strain at the front of the cannon and an overdevelopment on their forearm. We're going to be looking at that today. They're standing like this, trying to stretch this out. These hind feet will come under, and you'll have low heels and long toes on the back, and the same on the front. And that's going to change how they move. But that's how they're standing in the pasture, 22 and a half, 23 hours a day. So how are you going to change that just by trimming? You have to change how the body wants to stand. Yes, a really bad farrier trimmer can make your horse body sore, but it's not this, it's not this, and it's not this. You'll just notice it in your yoga. Your medial lateral balance can make joints sore, okay, and they will start to compensate. So that's why I'm saying work with your farrier trimmer. What are you seeing? You know, what are we seeing now? Okay, there's a horse that I worked on in Canada, huge bunchy muscles, and I took pictures of him, his knees are backwards, because he's been trying to stand over, and the farrier put him on some egg bar shoes, so the back of the leg goes to how it needs to go, but the rest of the body is trying to stand over here to relieve this. I mean, his front knees look like hawks. So we got those off, and we got everything changed in his body, and he's a happy little horse now. But you need to see the rest of the symptoms in the body of how they want to stand. And then all of a sudden, you're going to have amazing feet. If you're walking like this, you're going to have good feet. If you're walking like this, <laughs> and you're sluffing, and you're standing like this, you're not going to have a good hoof. Okay? Um, anybody know anything about cranial sacral? The head of the horse? Nope. Okay. You have 26 bones. They don't have joints, they're all sutures, they go like this. And they breathe six to eight times a minute, six to 14 times a minute, depending on the horse. These all need to move. One sit down, pull back, slam head, and you have bone shift in the head. Okay, everyone's like, well, what does that matter? Why do I care? Okay, any of these bone shift in your head, um, you'll grow hooks and waves because the horse can't chew laterally. The orbit of the eye shifts and it compresses the nerve back to the eye. You can lose your peripheral vision on one side, and that's a horse that spooks on one side. Now do you care? <laughs> okay, why do you have to float a horse's teeth every 10 months and the other horse can go two years? Okay, we were talking about resistance in giving it the pull on these two bones, okay? You can also come back to your TMJ joint. We actually, um, a client had a black driving pony and in evaluating her, one eye and one nostril had dropped down about three quarters of an inch. He took it one step further and measured from the pole to the side of where the bit is, and one side's a whole inch lower. And when he adjusted her head stall to drop that bit one inch, she stopped fighting with him on the left rein for the last, that she'd been fighting with for the last 10 years. Give me the bit, give me the bit, give me the bit. Everything through to her right hawk. Her right hawk is done. Everything in her body, pulling on the left rein, not giving to it, not being able to flex to it, all braced to the right hawk, and she's only 14 years old. But as soon as he changed that, so when we go and we evaluate a horse's heads, and we're going to be evaluating where their eyes are set and their nostrils are, if you have any of those horses, I'd like you to go measure from the middle of the pole down to their lips, okay? Just be conscious, um, three-piece bit would be nicer. Something that's not two-piece and forcing the jaw to move exactly. Something that would have a little more give for your TMJ joint. Something that can make the horse a little more comfortable. Uh, cranial sacral issues tighten down the whole skin of the body. The horse can have allergies, head shaking. Okay, everybody take your hand and push it over your skin. Okay? When you skin an animal, you'll see that white stuff that holds everything in. Okay, that's your fascia. Your skin is supposed to move over your muscle. Okay, when we go palpate horses today, you're going to be using the flat of your hand, and you're going to be pushing and moving and seeing how much give there is. If you come to here and it is locked down and there's no movement, that skin is so tight to the body, it's like this. Okay, I think I can stretch out and run now, but he can't. Okay, and if you happen to be using a non-slip pad or a crushed felt pad or something that has grip and their hide is gripping their muscle, 
do you think that might make the issue worse? Okay. So my clinic is more about what's going on in the horse's body and how can we work with them instead of against them. Until you can resolve those issues, a uh, longer wool felt pad would be nicer with the longer hairs to move since his skin isn't moving over his muscle. Having something that breathes, getting rid of the neoprene pads and the crushed felt pads, just being aware. Some horses don't have any issues, you're fine. I know as we get older and we don't want saddles to slide, we want some sticky tack pads or something that grips the horse, but they are detrimental. Okay, so we've talked about teeth, head, neck, body issues. Open it up for any questions. What is sit down pullback? Um, when a horse is tied and they, they spook at something. And they so and they sitting down. It's some horses do. Cross ties mm -hmm. and they pull back. They yeah, as hard as they can. As hard as they can. It does a lot of damage. Okay. Okay. And it hasn't been addressed yet. Um, anything else on what we've talked about so far? Okay. Anybody want to talk about horse health in the past five to ten years? Seeing more laminitis and Cushing's. Okay. Um, what else are we doing a lot more of? Vaccinating. Okay, not against the vets and not against your vaccination. I'm just asking you to not do them all at the same time. Thimerosal, which is mercury, um, formaldehyde, detergent, all those are preservative in the vaccines. They've taken them out for autistic kids. They're still in our pet vaccines and our vaccines. It's too much for the horse's system in one day. Okay, if you really want to build a strong immunity for something, just give them the one shot and let them work on it for three weeks. You will have a stronger immunity for West Nile if you don't do West Nile and rabies and East Western and everything else. It's an overload to all the cells in the horse's body. How can they build a strong defense against one thing? Okay, I know vets want to do it while they see you and while they're there, but if you're at bigger barns, get them all on a one month rotation. I'm seeing a lot of colics and tie-ups and issues and horses going down within 12 to 24 hours of the big vet clinics where they come and do all the shots in a day. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm not saying I'm against all that, just please don't do it all on the same day. Okay, I personally believe that that's where some of our Cushing's is coming from. Too much stress on your pituitary, which is up in here. Okay, tiny little thing inside the horse's brain. I actually got to do a dissection class. Okay, the other thing that I'm looking into are all these horses that have also taken a head trauma and cranial sacral. When all these bones can't move and your sphenoid and all your other bones inside become compressed and they can't breathe and they don't have their life force, could mercury and all those toxins come in on a compressed organ and start your Cushing's? Okay, you'll see a detox product in your handout called Natural Cellular Defense that I like. It actually removes all that. I've had clients that have been willing to try that. Nine to ten bottles has gotten them off the pergolide and back to being normal, but then you need to give it to them again when you're going to vaccinate them. Their system is so already susceptible. Same thing with shrinking melanomas. Okay, cancer cell is an unhappy cell. You need to bring the horse back to health and wellness. So you can have the most expensive diet on planet Earth into your horse, but if they cannot assimilate nutrition because the receptor sites are blocked, they're just peeing it out. Okay, Linda's horse, she's been feeding it extra magnesium because she knows it has a tight body. It's an old, um, she was a broodmare. Her body is so tight and acidic and her liver and kidneys to me feel so stressed that all the extra magnesium she was giving isn't being absorbed in the body. Mercury from the, all the vaccines um, mimics in the body magnesium. So the more eating the horses and the more mercury that's building up, the tighter and tighter they are getting as they get older. It's not getting out of their system. So you go from soft, healthy muscle to tight, short muscle. Okay, so can you see where some arthritis conditions might be coming in with heat, not loading joints, and some toxic issues? So I can do kinesiology and I can muscle test your horses for what they need, but I feel that you need to clear all the organs first to make sure that it's not because they can't assimilate your diet. I do like the dynamite products, but I don't try to force that on people. Let's just see what's in your diet is working in your area of the country and then see what they're missing. Seems to make more sense, less is more. 
assimilate more. I'm against alfalfa. Uh, we get to dissect and look at a head on a 20 year old horse that was uh, an alfalfa fed horse and all the excess calcification laid down in all the different sutures in the head. You couldn't find them. So if you have heat and calcium going to, if you have calcium going to heat in the body and you're feeding extra calcium, do you think you're going to get arthritis faster? Okay. The other good thing about the yoga is it lifts large and small intestine. The mare in the yoga video went and had the largest manure pile the owner had ever seen just after doing the whole 30 minute session of yoga. So if your horse is laid up in stall, stall rest, hurt, anything, even just a front leg frog bruise or stone bruise or something, they're going to shift. They're going to tighten down. The yoga is a good thing to keep them supple. You will isometrically build your dressage horse, even if you just want a trail ride, to correctly go down the trail standing in a stall. Our saying is, could it be that easy? Okay, and if anybody's going to ask why didn't so and so professional tell me this, I, uh, my favorite word is locos, lack of knowledge on subject. Okay, I used to retrain problem horses. I build and condition top endurance horses, and then I wanted to find out why things were not working in their bodies. So I'm one of the few people that took courses in five different modalities to blend them because I didn't think anyone was enough. And as a writer and trainer, realizing how it comes to the person on top. You know, people say, well, can you just fix the hawk? Well, no. <laughs> I can fix why the hawk is sore. You want to do that instead? Oh, yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, could you do that? Yeah, let's trace it backwards. So your end result's here, and it's here, and it's here, but it started here. No, 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 it's way back here. No, really, it started here. So a lot of left shoulder is going to throw back to right hock. Okay, left shoulder is going to make this stifle sore and that inside hock sore. You're going to come in and then you're going to start to see when they stand all the time in the rear, a jammed heel and a flare that you're always falling off on the hinds, your meter lateral imbalance in your hinds. Okay, when a horse is catching front feet with rear feet, okay, don't slow down the rear feet. Figure out why the front feet aren't picking up. Okay, let's catch these things earlier. People say, well, the yoga is too hard to do. My horse fights me. It's a diagnostic tool. Okay, if your horse cannot do this, you need some more help. It's your diagnostic tool. Do I have to do it every day? No, you can let your horse go back to what it was. Make your choice. I would like to see people do it every day for 30 days to build that horse. It could take an hour the first day for you to do the yoga correctly. Okay? It needs to get down to a four and a half minute routine. Okay? You do a carrot stretch back to here. You do the front leg drunken horse pose. They like it so much they want to stay there. You're like, oh, can you get, okay, let's do the next yoga thing, okay? And you roll the butt up and they come up like a cat and all the ribs spring and then you lift the belly and the withers and your horse just grew two inches. Okay, I'm ready to go to work. You know, or just do it before you ride. But if you can do it consistently to build that base, <laughs> then you only have to come back to that base before you ride. Okay? I hate seeing at the Jim Cannon barrel racing shows kids sitting on their horses in the shade Okay, within 15 minutes of being girthed up in a treed saddle, the horse's back goes numb. You lose your oxygen and blood flow just because it's a compressed area. Good fitting saddle or not. Okay, you have a pressure right here for a long period of time. Do you think your hand's going to go to sleep? Can not answer? Okay, so get those kids off. Okay, loosen the girth. My yoga is designed to do with tack on. I don't care if you're carriage driving a horse, hunter jumper. You will run your courses and do your events at the same speed at the end of the day as the beginning of the day if you do this after each event. I see um, some of the events where they have to just tie them to the carriage um, or the stall or whatever so they don't get dirty in between it shows. Do your yoga immediately after. Get the lactic acid out of the muscles before they have to stand. Do a quick one before they have to go again. Do the next event just as well. You won't be beating them and giving them all this stuff and everything because they're so sore after. Okay, check your flexibility. So we talked about vaccinations, health, vitamins, how things should be able to move. Any questions before we go start evaluating a horse? 
think about uh, horse that backs up and pops lock up and they click and someone said it was string hole? We'll have to go check him out. Did you bring him? No, he's not mine. He's a pit <laughs> Oh. Say so we'd have to go see what else in the body isn't working? I had a question with your vaccination. Um, I work at a, a place where you have several horses and the one particular mare never used to get bad reactions, but the last several years given, and they do, we do the like four to six at a time vaccinations. And the last two years, she's actually uh, been stall rested for like three days because she can't even walk, her neck is so sore. Ah, and your little mind inside here is saying something's not right, but you still did it? Well, every year she gets vaccinations. And right. But you, kn but you know something's year, adding up. Something's going on because right. she never used to get this. I'm trying to get people to start listening to that little birdie. Right. Okay, so you're back to everything is... Much. Right, yeah. Her body is so toxic, her liver and kidneys are so stressed that she can't handle it anymore which means any horse sick in the barn or anything else that comes down, she's going to get it. So that's what that detox information is about. Then knowing in future that she's more susceptible to that, breaking them up and giving her that detox product at the same time that you have to give it to her because it pulls out all the heavy metals. It pulls out mercury and lead and arsenic and stuff. There's stuff in the water they're drinking nowadays. There's stuff on their hay that's sprayed. It's just an overload that we didn't have on these horses 20 years ago. The air is dirtier on the freeway going down the horse trailer. Now they're behind diesel pickup trucks, you know, and everything else. So everything that they're taking in is just building up in their systems. So come back to clearing liver and kidney, clearing all that out, letting their organs function. And then just, you know, doing one a month on her. Kind of a pain, but some of those shots you can do yourself. Good for a try. I mean, she's had them for the year already, so... Spring shots have already been given, so. But you should still think about detoxing her. That's what I mean, and detoxing. Right, because a horse that's actually. not assimilating nutrition really well is not going to have good feet. Mm -hmm. Look at people that are in pain and don't feel good. Do they have really good fingernails and hair? No. Mm -hmm. Okay, so instead of just jumping to the hoof uh, supplements, mm -hmm. you need to detox the whole body so they're assimilating and nutrition and then see if you still need it. So, you know how long it takes for a hoof to grow out, right? Mm -hmm. Then three to four weeks of being on the NCD, the farrier see a totally different hoof. My horses were on dynamite vitamins for two or three years before I found out about the NCD and the thick wall, the um, hoof wall, grew a sixteenth to a quarter of an inch on all four of my endurance horses' feet in thickness. Just the resilience and everything, and they already had great feet. Never lost shoes, never crumbled. But they were now assimilating more of their nutrition program. Mm -hmm. Their liver and kidneys are running, you know, clearer. That's interesting because she also is like, you, one, you would think almost just cushionoid because she always has longer hair, big bloated belly. But that's getting to the pre cushings and the not healthy stuff. So those are all your little signs, and that's what I'm trying to wake mm -hmm. people up to that we have this little inkling that something's not right, but we didn't know who to ask. Mm -hmm. You know, this horse isn't like the same. So when I evaluate horses at a barn in different parts of the country, I have to look at all the horses to see if one's hanging on to hair. Mm -hmm. You know, what's the feet look like? Usually when you see pre-cushings, you're also going to see terrible feet. Not necessarily laminitis yet, but you're going to be getting it soon. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a bunch of different theories on this. I personally believe that when the liver and kidneys can't detox anymore, the horse is going to blow out through their feet. And on those horses, within three weeks of using an ivermectin warmer, you usually will see an abscess. Interesting. <laughs> Starting to think about some things. Even just how horses is packing and loading a feet. Okay, everywhere you're standing the most on your hoof, you're going to have the most blood supply. So, again, when we come to standing over here and, and wanting the farriers to take the toe back, when the blood supply is there and they can't trim it back, what are you supposed to do? You can set the shoe back and you can do all these things, but you're changing how the body's trying to, re to relieve itself from pain. So you need to get into the whole body and then you're going to have the best farrier in the world. And your farrier's going to go, wow, I really like your horses because they're so comfortable to just stand there for me. They don't fight. They're just... <sighs> so I really recommend doing the yoga before your farrier comes. Make sure those hips are really comfortable to come up here and stand on the stand. Okay, we're going to evaluate some horses and 
not being racial or anything, but picture a happy big Jamaica woman walking down town, okay? <laughs> okay. Your horse's head should be swinging like this. It should not be doing what we call a chicken walk. Okay. Each scapula needs to come through like this. The whole belly and rib cage should be swinging side to side. It shouldn't be locked down. Okay, that huge roll back and forth that lets you know that the whole diaphragm can expand to collect and breathe. Okay, especially your thoroughbreds on the track. I was going to say, I'm just looking at yeah. Okay, um, and then the hips need to be moving independently. So I do not want to see any horses. But it's funny because we'll be evaluating riders too because the riders will be walking the same way. Okay? So when I do work on your horses, I am going to ask you to rebalance the feet sometime soon because they will now have an open body on crooked feet, which will sore them again. Okay? The other thing is, is if you think, you know, oh, my hip hurts too, and his hip hurts, oh, my shoulder hurts, and his hips, yeah. I would really just go into a chiropractor and get some body work for you if we're going to work on your horse. Then you'll have balanced feet, balanced body, balanced horse, because people say, is this going to come back? Well, no, not if you do all your homework. You need to do your yoga, you need to get your feet balanced, and then you need to see if you're dropping a hip in the saddle. On my repeat customers, if these ribs keep dropping, they said, so you're locking that left knee and ankle, huh? Did she tell you? <laughs> yeah, the whole body's like this, okay? <laughs> Anything that works harder, and I'm not trying to make people feel guilty, doesn't necessarily hurt in the process of doing it. You work too hard painting or whatever, oh, it's kind of sore. It's when you go to bed and you wake up the next day and you're stiff. Okay, and then they have to do it again and then it's tight and it's pulling and stretching on something else because it's not elastic and it doesn't give. Okay, so don't go back into, oh my god, I hurt my horse, you know, they work from love. They do as best as they can. 205 bones, 700 muscles, they got a lot to borrow from. Okay, but they shouldn't need to. How long does it take to get a really well-trained horse that does everything perfectly for you? Okay, how, long, how much longer after that do you have to still ride them before they start tripping and stumbling? Okay, yeah, what if you had another 15 years after the point that they had a really good mind and knew their job? Great. Would that be worth doing yoga? Mm -hmm. Ah, especially as we get older and the ground gets harder. <laughs> that horse just you love doesn't spook, nothing phases them, that garbage truck, everything can come down and you know you can go on a ride. You know your kids can ride that horse and it's not going to bolt down the road. What is that worth? Okay, you get these hunter jumper and these schooling horses and the pony just knows the thing and he always gets a blue ribbon and all of a sudden he's stumbling in the hawk and he's tripping and, you know, unfortunately a lot of times they get sold off cheap to a home that doesn't understand all these issues and their kids just ride them and it makes it worse and then they go again. And they're at the horse rescue place or something and saying, I can't do the job anymore. Okay, when they start saying, I can't do the job anymore, they can get aggressive about it. Fighting, kicking, bucking. Okay, I'm also here to prevent any future hospital bills. Okay? <laughs> if your horse can do the yoga, you really shouldn't have any biting, kicking, bucking, pulling back. Everything's comfortable in the body. Anything else you guys want to ask before we go evaluate horses? How long does it usually take if you have one? I, I call them, we have a lot of little geriatrics um, where you've described in your whole conversation a lot of the horses we have. So once you start like working with the yoga and different things, you know, most of them are 20 to 30 years old. Do they come back or? Are you talking about if I work on them or if I don't work on them? If you're, if you're working on them. If I work on them. Okay, because all of these had a reason. Okay, so the yoga is a diagnostic tool. Okay, if they can't do the yoga, then you need someone to fix the deeper issues. Okay, so if you fix the deeper issues and you bring the whole body out to here and you balance the feet and you get them on, I tell everybody, any horse over the age of 10 should be on a joint supplement. Okay, you want to keep, each joint has so many miles like a tire. Okay, if this didn't do its job for 15 years and this had to compensate, so you have 30,000 miles on this joint and 70,000 miles on this joint, what do you need to do to prevent this joint from breaking down further? Okay, there are photon therapy lights, um, laser lights, dynamite wound bomb sweats to break down calcifications. Calcifications don't need to stay there. Blood flow and circulation can, once broken down, take them out of the area. Okay, same thing, we've been having really good luck with side bone and ring bone. Okay, that is stemming from the horse not loading the front feet correctly and in pain and trauma in the hoof and the calcifications. 
There's a lot of other things you can do for to make an avicular horse more comfortable. Okay, lube in that sheath. There's a lot of things that can be done. You just have to kind of know where to look and where to ask. I was really lucky that I studied with Dr. Regan Golub and he's usually the one I always ask about whatever kind of questions going on and he'll tell you exactly what to do for it. You know, maybe the horse shouldn't be a steeplechaser anymore, but you can get him to a comfortable life where he can ride down the trail and carry some kids. Horses do not enjoy sitting out in pasture by themselves. They really do like working and being loved and groomed. And the ones that don't, we work on those too. That's something called reverse polarity. And when you change all that, they go from the horse standing out there to, Hi! <laughs> Itchy scratching me! I'm here! I want attention! So you can actually change personalities when you take horses out of pain. The last thing I want to get into is horses that can't put weight on. Okay, when we start evaluating horses, pain dumps endorphins. Not endorphins, scratch that, adrenaline. If you're on adrenaline, can you stand still? If you're on adrenaline, are you going to gain weight? If you're on adrenaline, do you want to feed protein and sugar? Okay. So the horses that are hard keepers, you know, one look into if they have ulcers, but if they have some of these issues that we're looking at and they're in pain, you need to get them out of pain and get them more on a carbohydrate diet. I prefer to sow beet, uh, a little bit of beet pulp, some grass hay pellets, get them back to eating their grass hays, not grains, not sugars, not anything else. Protein and sugar adds to nerve ending pain. When you are in pain, they tell you to go alkaline. If you're going to have a whole bunch of coffee and you're in pain, you're going to be a whole bunch more hurting. Okay, so we talked about skinny horses. We got IR horses, right? It's almost like two sides of the same coin, isn't it? Uh, yeah, but IR horses, in my opinion, is really close to type 2 diabetes, which is heavy metal toxicity. And I've been seeing a lot of these IR horses had previously chewed on boards, which is arsenic and pressure treated wood. <coughs> So again, you're trying to balance the thyroid and your pituitary. So I still go back to that product. Detox. Uh-huh. Of removing everything and then starting all over and seeing what's left. Why can't the body balance itself? What is out of whack in the organs? I have a question. Um, so if you detox, that takes all of the medications out of their system? No. It's heavy metals. Just heavy metals. It actually alkalines the whole body and all prescription meds work better. All prescription meds, even by the vets, were meant to work in an alkaline environment. So you will need to retest as you're detoxing because you will probably have to cut your doses down. Bummer, huh? High blood pressure meds, thyroid meds, pergolide will work better. Okay. There might still be some DVDs that you left on and CDs. Yeah, we're not. Okay, yeah. We got done? All right, so we're going to take a break and then we're going to come back and we're going to evaluate horses. Good boy, so I want my yoga. So which um, front was tighter? The left one. Good boy. Which one did he jerk and pull back on? Okay. Left front throws the right rear? Or does the sore right rear throw the left front? So we worked on him yesterday and we got the stretches the same, but him compensating for right rear is going to throw back to left front. So in your yogas, you want to make sure you get the same stretch without a pullback. Oh boy. It's opening everything deep under here that no human hand can get to. Oh boy. Stretch. Oh, there. Shush. Shush, shush, shush. Really? Yeah, I like that. <laughs> Remember Blazing Saddles, Drunken Horse? <laughs> Liking that. It's a good one. So your eventual goal is all the way over here, okay? But it frees up everything deep in here that nobody can get to. 
The hole heavy on the front end is all tight muscle attachments under the bone. All right. So your first rib is up here. You just stretched out the first seven to eight ribs. If you don't have a belly lift, you need to start on your first eight ribs. Okay? Then you need to come back to here. If you put your hand up on here, and if your horse is safe to stand behind, you're going to be pulling on the same angle as his croup. And he should be digging in toes and pulling back against you. If they're moving away, you have a lot of pain in your lower lumbar area. And you just need to add a little bit of pressure. Okay, until he's ready to square up. Good boy. Come on. You can do it. See how narrow his hocks are? Do I want to teach him to use his hind end with his hocks together? See, there you go. See how they're open? So, and when you let go, let go really slow. In their conformation versus posture. Hey, buddy. His hips here. Shh. I know. His hips here. His hock should be here. I know, buddy. And his hoof should be out here. Your hock should be straight back and under your hip for your hind end to come back to that we talked about earlier. If they're all base narrow in here, you don't have a true hind end to come back to use. You're not going to have drive and push. You ever tried to lift something like this? You're using these outside muscles in this. So are they. When you go to lift something, do you go like this? Okay. Hey, buddy. So that stretches out your lower lumbar. Good boy. I know. You don't want to use your hind end. Okay? Because it hurts. He's uncomfortable. This is a really tight area. Good boy. So your yoga is go there and hold. Isometric. Good boy. Getting all this tight muscle up here to release on top of your 18th and 17th rib. You've seen other butt tucks that are up here and up here and they do different things. The one that I do way out here actually works on these ribs. Bringing your hind end under to be able to collect, lift, and push. He says, oh, what you doing, honey? Doing the Morgan pose. Yeah. Are you a Morgan? Okay, the whole back should be able to go in the other direction. Do you get taller? <laughs> okay. Withers are not attached to the shoulders. They need to be able to lift up out. There we go. So what I'm doing is bringing up all these back spasms and the ribs are opening and stretching the tight muscles from underneath. Good boy. And just keep alternating till you get what you want. Good boy. Oh, oh. Shush, 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 shush. Yeah. Should have seen him yesterday before we worked on him. Shh. I know. Good boy. See the rear ribs starting to finally let go? Good boy. Getting broader. Ah. So when your, butt, when your back is tight and dropped, you just have short muscles on top and you need to stretch those muscles out. So is a yoga stretch a, I did it! Or is it, oh god it hurts, oh, oh I gotta stretch, oh, okay. felt better. Right? So you gotta do the same thing with your horses. Don't do this if you're in a hurry. Shh, good boy. So do you think he can lift and collect and breathe better now? And get his hind end under him to actually use it? There we go. Good boy. Is his neck getting longer out of the shoulder? Shush, 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 
So if they can do this and haul this, do you think you can keep the back up for the next 15, 20 years of riding? As long as you don't have a really bad saddle. There you go. So where does Withers go? There we go. Does he seem to be resisting less? It should be comfortable for them to do it. Okay. Did you hear all the tummy gurgles? Okay, I'm also lifting large and small intestine, and I'm moving gas, and I'm moving stagnant hay. Can you see how in the middle of winter, when it's icy, cold, and they're not drinking, and they're not moving around? Hi, buddy. You want to give him a neck? <laughs> Remember that one we did for the neck? Mm -hmm. Stand back just a little, and then hold his head right there. Hi, buddy. Let's get you a neck out of the shoulder. Good boy. I know. There you go. Yeah. Cool. So if you guys want to see that on the side, okay? Right there. Don't let him drop his head too much. There. There you go. Good boy. Good day. But if he can do all this on the ground, do you think he can now do it on the saddle? Under saddle? And if he can't do it on the ground, do you think he could do it under saddle? Okay, so that's what the yoga is all about. He crashed and burned and had a right hawk issue that we're actually working on right now. Um, he's not one of the horses we're really going to evaluate. You guys can come look at this calcification, which doesn't need to be here from an old injury. That can be gone with a wound bomb sweat. He actually had first rib out. Was on this side yesterday? Both sides, right? Okay. He actually had first rib out on both sides, which they'll get from leaning over a solid fence. Remember, first rib makes it so the scapula can't move, and they're going to throw back extra stress to the hind end. But if you can, <laughs> there's no cookies. If you come in, where's the other horses? They're supposed to be up here. Okay. If you come in and look at the balance of his coronet band. Look at the hair at the hairline. Okay, does it look happy and balanced? Okay. Here is where I'm looking. See the hair? See the where it's scruffy and it's puffed up? Oh, here. Yeah. And it's scruffy <laughs> and it's puffed up. It'll tell you where he's loading and jamming. Inside. Okay, he was really tight to the front leg crossovers, so a horse that's really tight in here and can't do the front leg crossovers is going to be coming and landing on your inside first. Mm. Ah, huh? On this problem. Yeah. yeah. So wherever you have a tightness in the way that they're standing yeah, is, well, is how you're going to be growing your hoof. So all your frustration with why isn't it getting it better. Yeah. Okay. Where so, the of the hoof more than... Well, it's just even how they're standing in the pasture all day. Mm -hmm is what your hoof's going to grow, not so much of how when we get on them and they're compensating a whole new way. The hoof that you're seeing is how they're standing 23 hours a day. Mm -hmm. You need to change. When I see my horse up there two acres away standing with one foot in front of the other in the pasture, I'm like, I'm coming, Tiki, because in six weeks I'm going to have a high-low if I don't go fix that. Mm -hmm. And can it be that easy? It's just a front leg crossover stretch? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Might take 15 minutes, but you need to get him back to both front feet standing here uh -huh. and both... <laughs> We know. <laughs> he said you could. You got a really big bean out of my thingy yesterday. Yeah, I like it. Okay. The other thing you want to look at is um, standing sideways. The balance of your hairline. Which one's dropped? Which one's more level? Do they match? So if he's in a high-low slipper sh shoe with this being on all down, how's the front end going to travel after that? If you wore someone else's shoe and they scruffed off on the outside, <laughs> okay. So you can keep trying to shape it and you can keep trying to trim it, but you got to change how it loads 23 hours a day. Okay. Does he look happy in the hind end? Step him up one. Try to square him up. Good answer. Good question. Yeah. On his own. Right. 
so that's not it's good. Like the so he has a really tight groin. He's one of the ones who said that we could um, palpate him. Oh, you don't want everybody feeling, honey? <laughs> okay. This right is really tight, so if you look at his hind hoof, this heel's jammed, and he's growing that flare. Because this is how he chooses to stand all day. If he was 100%, would he choose to stand like this? Yeah, a horse should okay. choose to stand like this okay. and cock, and cock, oh, and cock. And if you do that, man, that feels good. You're like, oh, that just releases a sacrum back here. Okay. You do not want to see this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You do not want to see back on a toe. Okay. This is but okay. Just back and you don't want to see on a toe. He should be so happy in his joints that he just cocks and he stays there. And the cock comes from the hock. No, it comes from dropping I mean, the which, sacrum. Which see bent is <laughs> the stifle. Right here? But wouldn't they, don't they? No, okay. you know the no one they it would put be up, up in the yeah. stifle area okay. is where you see the bend. Okay. Yeah, the stifle's like the, the, our knee kind of thing. Oh, okay. So if you come and look at his hiney end. Hi, buddy. Can you walk him up so we can get around no. the back of him? Oh, no? Oh. Sorry. Okay. We can get around behind you, I don't think. Yeah. So if you come and look at him. Ooh. Okay. Flies. You'll see see from his heel bulbs and his hock turned in because he had a tight groin which we started to relieve that he's growing those feet. His hocks are a lot closer yesterday. We opened up the groin a little bit and moved it a little bit out. So when you have tightness up here, this spasm up here lets me know that it's the groin attachment right in there coming down to the inside of the hock is overly tight. And I'm going to let you guys feel all that in a minute. So does he look like right hocks more, a little bit more tighter and in? A little more protective? Mm -hmm. Okay, so until you make that comfortable, do you think you're going to have a good right foot to trim? April, can I revisit that, the stance that you were talking about? So many yeah, we're going to go through it on all three. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to see if he's okay to palpate. Come here, buddy. You going to let everybody, okay? Everybody push with your hand just against your thigh. No fingers. Nice and soft. Does it move? Yeah. Everywhere on your horse's coronet band should be soft and palatable. Okay? You're going to come down here with a thumb and push all the way around. Where you start to feel firmness is your calcifications and adhesions and your side bone starting. And they will coincide with where the hair is scruffy. Where the horse is jamming and loading first, you have heat, which brings in calcium, which is side bone. Okay, you can reverse that process with a dynamite wound bomb sweat. Okay. okay, you shave up to here and you sweat it two to three times a week. It's a real easy process and in about two or three months all of this firmness would go away. This is from him not loading the hoof correctly and you could work on this as well. <laughs> so now we're going to talk about the myofascial layers, how tight the, the horse's hide is to the body. Okay, you all put your hand down on your skin and you moved it, okay? Your fascia is your lubrication layer, okay? So with the flat of your hand again, okay? You start up here and you just kind of come down and you see what moves and you shouldn't have to push hard to get it to move. Okay? You'll see as you get into here you have less movement. So since the energy comes in like this, it's going to stay tight all the way back to here. He only has his life force healing energy to about here. Everything in here is still so tight and locked down. We worked on him yesterday, unwinding everything in the front end that was throwing back to the hind end. Okay, so repeated yoga and everything is going to continue all this softening. But if you feel in here, Okay, it really starts to get tight and hard. So if you had a big square skirt western saddle pad that didn't have any give, and this is right over his liver and kidneys, here's your psoas muscle that lifts your stifle. Do you think this part of his back being this tight and hard is going to want to come up at the canter and actually collect? He's going to avoid and he's going to drop back. Okay, when back drops, head comes up. So if you got a high-headed horse, you need to look to see where your back is. Okay.
Okay. Did you want so to we're going to be evaluating this horse right now. Um, I start by, this is totally flat, this is overdeveloped. It lets me know that the horse could not bend at the pole correctly. This muscle is atrophied and this to me shows me that he has some kind of pullback damage sometime in the past sitting down and pulling. So because he could not bend correctly to get on the bit for his sport, he started to jam all these down into the shoulder. He's really only using three out of seven neck bones in his flexibility and his telescoping. That's going to make a heavy on the forehand horse. The owner would have been trying to get him to collect and it would have transferred back to the hind end. So this has not been used correctly. This has not been used correctly. This is an overdevelopment. Your nuchal ligaments in here of your trapezius and your rhomboids to pick up the shoulder because the shoulders could not come through freely and correctly on their own. So he has this on both sides. This muscle here has overworked because another part couldn't do its job. We come into here, this muscle is overdeveloped. He was choosing to stand over the forend to alleviate and stretch out some lower back issues, okay, which was giving him low heel, long toe. This is in spasm. This is overdeveloped. The farrier has been trying to remedy this and give him um, more heel support so he can grow the heel down, but it's not how the body is wanting to stand at this present time. So this part of his body is trying to stand over to relieve issues, and it's making this lock and go backwards because it's not matching the leg and the hoof. We come back into here. You can kind of see some, it almost looks like scoliosis. Your withers are free floating with your ribs. They're not attached by bone to the shoulder. You can kind of see where this comes over and it goes back. So his withers are a little bit off in this direction. So this whole, in riding him, the whole front end of this horse would have been locked down. He would have been heavy on the floor and they would have kept trying to get him to come back to the hind end. You come back in here, he's been out to pasture for a year. He shouldn't have a lot of noticeable muscling. If you come back to here, you'll notice this huge cut of muscle. The horse has been going so far back to the hind end to pick up an uncomfortable front end that he's overdeveloped the muscle coming down into the hock in your bicep femoris. When we come back and we palpate his groin, um, it's not soft and pliant. Everything in here is really, really tight. That tightness will give you this evidence of this cow hocked horse with both his ankles coming together. So the inside of his hocks are stretched. His hawk is actually out of alignment on this side. So he's rocking back and forth between a front end that's comfortable and a hind end that's comfortable. And there's nowhere in his body that he can find a comfortable place to stand. So currently he's not rideable and he's not comfortable. And we're going to be working on that. Okay, he's angry. I got a cute butt. <laughs> I got a cute butt. I got a cute butt. He says I probably have some belly lifts. Not much, but he should be about this tall. And his back should be about here. This is all shrinking down from being in pain. So if he, we were to ask him for a yoga carrot stretch, he'd probably get to about this far. Okay, so in the yoga, he wouldn't be able to do the front leg crossovers. You should be seeing the top of the scapula, a dip in the separation and withers. When they're this tight and you have this little ski slope, everything in here is so tight that the whole front end's traveling like this. You need a neck that comes out, shoulders that come out, withers that lift, and the horse needs to be able to travel like this to carry us under saddle. There's nothing in this horse. These withers should come up to here that the wither can separate. Remember the scapula is only attached by muscle underneath and not bone. And everything should be able to move independently and freely. So now we're going to go to work.